things don't always work out the way we plan, do they? Um, so I, I think there's time left in a year that we could get some of these lessons in, but I wanted to start, kind of reset us here with that verse in Revelation 19, 13, because it's one of my favorites in the Bible. And so this lesson I've titled, Understand Jesus, but it's in the line of the life of Christ. Um, because it's something that we have a standard We have an example to follow. The song we just sang, Footprints of Jesus. Um, I can remember early on in, uh, in my, one of my business ventures that uh, one of the speakers always used to write these big, draw these big circles on the grease board and say they're simple footsteps. Just follow the footsteps. You know, if you want this, do this. And so, Revelation 19, 13 really sums up for us <clears throat> who Jesus is. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. You know, as we've been studying in our Bible lessons, in various lessons in various groups throughout the week, um, we've been making the point about the apostles presenting a living Christ, that Jesus lived and walked among us. First John, or John chapter one, verse 1 and following that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Nothing was created that by Him all things were created. In John 1, 14, and that Word, which is the light of men, became flesh and dwelt among us. And John, in his first letter, uh, 1 John 1.1 one, one says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. I want to say, we've made the point that the early believers believed Jesus was the Christ under very, we would say, unusual circumstances, especially for the pagans and the belief system they were coming out of, but they saw him. It, it is not possible for a human being to do what Jesus did. It is not possible. So what are we left with? And as we look at some Old Testament studies. One of our studies is in Exodus on Wednesday afternoon. And the whole book of Exodus or the first five books, the books of the law, the Pentateuch, um, are recorded for our learning. It is a testimony from God as an appeal so that we could get to know God. So what I'm saying this morning is we don't have an eyewitness. What we have is a testimony from historically reliable documents. And God prepared this testimony in such a way that it's irrefutable for an honest intellect to study it. Now, I confess this morning in our Bible class, which was very lively this morning, which is good, all right? I like that when we, we come alive. And I really encourage if anybody wants to continue in fellowship today, join us at two o'clock as we, as we fellowship and help uh, build up 
Southwest. It was Joe Priester and his son Joey that came and filled in for us. Um, they show their support for us. We'd like to show our support for them. Um, but we don't have this eyewitness testimony. We're some 2,000 years removed from this visual or knowing somebody that we trust real well that was healed by Jesus or had their life restored or were with him when he fed the multitude. And so the countless number that saw Jesus after he resurrected so that there would be no doubt. We have to do something. Now, in the world today, we could argue that, make excuses for the events that happened 2,000 years ago. If we don't consult the documents, we could make excuses for it. What I want us to understand here is this testimony of God claims to be from God and it is presented in such a way that I challenge you, if you read it and study it, could it have come from the mind of men? That's the question for us that we're asking so many thousand years after the fact. Um, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, when, when Moses was given this uh, book of the law on Mount Sinai and he recited it to the congregation there and they recorded it and documented it. And my challenge is, could it have been produced by man? In my study, when I began my quest to seek out truth, I tried to fit every belief I had into the early text in Genesis and Exodus. And over time, it just doesn't work. It, it, God reveals himself in the text. So by the time Jesus comes along, you cannot say, oh, Jesus just did this because of this, or these circumstances were just coincidental. It was written, it was documented hundreds of years before Jesus ever appeared to man. And so last night we had an interesting Devo and I read from Romans chapter one because I follow things. I'm probably maybe too techy uh, at times and intellectual but I watched these images coming back from the JWST, which is this, this now this uh, next generation telescope after the Hubble, the HST, the Hubble Scientific Telescope, is now the James Webb Scientific Telescope that was launched at the end of 2021. And it's really bringing back some disturbing images that are really blowing up the model from the Big Bang. And it's causing the scientists, I'll use Q's finger quotes, the scientists, the royal scientists, uh, to have real issues. They don't know what to do with this information. And so I read from Romans chapter one last night where Paul makes the argument that we are without excuse God made it clear in creating everything that it's obvious there is a creator. I remember, or I, I mentioned that I was out picking up those disgusting bark falling down from that sick tree out there. The sycamore tree has these big seeds. Well, they're like seed heads with a whole bunch of seeds wrapped around it. And then they fall, they make a mess of everything. And they hurt your feet when you step on them too. Um, yeah, Mary knows, because Mary does a lot of the cleaning up out there too. It's just an awful mess. But I think everything in this life comes with the seed of regeneration. And in that seed 
is all the information for new life. That is not explained by any random chance or evolutionary theory that all that information would be in there. Man cannot create life, but let me tell you something else. Man cannot destroy life either. God holds, we sing that song, God holds the germ within his hand. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, this morning that I'm going to make it very simple and encouraging for us. The first thing we need to know as Christians, as believers, is God created us, yes. That is, it's very calming and peaceful to know that I didn't create myself, thankfully, because now I don't have to answer to myself. <laughs> uh, God created me, and he created you. And what that means is he has a purpose for us. And that's number one, Linda. The three Ps this morning for our lesson is the first one is purpose. God created us for a purpose. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul wrote in verses 3 to 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. And let me give you the second P, which is perspective. Not my perspective, God's perspective. It's revealed in the parable of the prodigal son that we know so well. As recorded in Luke 15, verses 20 to 24, this is the way God pictures our existence. It's not that he doesn't know us. And I would say Ecclesiastes is a wonderful book for this perspective. Um, I challenged a young man when I was in China to uh, consider this, that Solomon, the wealthiest man in the world ever, on many levels, not just in material wealth, but in wisdom as well, concluded and he had all the resources to do this on a scale that we could never even come close to. But he did what every human heart wants to do, find satisfaction in our own creation, in our own ability. And Solomon exhausted all his resources to make the conclusion that's chasing after the wind fear God and obey his commands and that's where true joy lies here's the perspective we ask for our inheritance father give me what is mine and let me go do it my way as the chairman of the board would sing that's old blue eyes for those who remember I did it my way. You don't want to hear me sing today. We take those resources and we go and we try to find happiness, fulfillment, joy. And in the end, the man arose and came to his father. This is Luke 15, 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet 
and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to celebrate imagine the love of God I don't understand so many things in this life I've been watching these debates excuse me I've been watching these debates of atheists and Christians and the argument is how could a loving God allow such suffering in the world I don't understand this cycle of death and life that we're subjected to in this world I don't understand it I do know this that if you want to equate an equivalency of life to everything then everything we do causes death to something else our very existence causes death and that's true with everything we create everything we create has to be created out of something that already exists so by definition we're destroying something to create something else that's the cycle of life but that's the circumstance that we find ourselves in and God in his word made it clear to us uh, that we're not to view this uh, in that what I would call that zero-sum game I used to teach this when I was in China that this idea that uh, everybody all my students there wanted to become Bill Gates rich or Jackie Ma they want to be a billionaire and but yet their values say everything you have and everything you gain is taking it from somebody else and that causes a dilemma in our psyche um, and I, I would encourage them that's not true <laughs> wealth begets wealth it, it, it's amazing to me as I watch these images of galaxies upon galaxies there is no shortage of resources in this universe God created and as far as I can tell we got the whole place to ourselves pretty incredible we're not running out of resources but God's perspective is I've given you all you need and when you come to your senses I'm right here to welcome you back home God gave us free will to choose so what philosophy will we follow in this life that has a large part to do with our success because success is not measured in by one element alone success ultimately is not money or status it's how you feel about yourself ultimately that's where success ends and God says I will never leave you nor forsake you when you come to your senses I'll be here and, and, and look at the attitude of the prodigal as he's coming and he's saying I don't even deserve to be called your son I'm a broken man a sinner not worthy and God says like Hugh reminds us you are worthy because I said so God says to us what a great story but that's the perspective that's the God perspective he gave us purpose he shared his perspective with us and here's what he asks and here's a successful life the third P is in the preparation so I said Jesus is this living word so if we examine these words we get to know who Jesus is and we get to know the expectations of God who wants us to be like Jesus and so 
The preparation is revealed in Jesus' culmination. When Jesus' ministry began, he was baptized, and now he's taken away into the wilderness, and he is tempted. And in this temptation, God reveals to us that we have to learn, we need to respect and worship. And this is what we see in the temptation. So in other words, we're all going to be tested in this life. And how we do in that test will largely be determined on how well we prepare. The first temptation was Satan comes to Jesus and tells him he can turn this stone into bread. And Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days. And his response was because Satan used scripture, used the word of God to entice Jesus. And Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone but every word that comes from the mouth of God. God knows we need bread to eat, but he also knows we need the bread of life, the word, his word, if we're gonna have a life eternal. And so Jesus revealed that in the temptation. Next, Satan takes Jesus up and tells him, well, you could jump off of this building because, you know, God will save you, his angels will rescue you. And Jesus said, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So, again, what Jesus revealed to us is we must learn from this word and then we must respect the word giver. And finally, the final temptation for Jesus was bow down to Satan. And he said, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And worship is something that God alone deserves. As we see through his testimony, God is a jealous God, and he doesn't like us worshiping our creation. He wants us to worship the creator. And so there it is. We have this preparation. And that's my encouragement today, that I've been saying, and uh, I pick on Marion a lot in our class, because we've come a long way, Marion, haven't we? Uh, it, 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 it seems like we've been together forever, you know, but it really has only been a short time. And yet, look how confident you are in this word now. If somebody says something in class and Marion's right there, Irene's like, you go get her. <laughs> um, and where does that confidence come from? It was a long time, right? Of, and I promise you that if you stick with this word your confidence will grow and things that were difficult to understand will become clearer so I'm not going to read what I read last night it's from Romans chapter 1 the, Paul making the argument that Man in his foolishness will worship things he creates, the creation rather than the creator. The gospel call is God's call for us to return to our senses and come home. That's 2 Thessalonians 1.8.
God promises if we truly seek, we will find. It's at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll be talking about as we examine the life of Christ. At the end of the sermon, he said, build your house on a rock. And, uh, but understand that if you seek, you will find. It's a promise God gives us. The world says we cannot understand this. And our own experiences, as we talked about in our class this morning, our own experiences often short-circuit us from wanting to stay in this word because like the Israelites at the base of the mountain, we say, I don't want to hear anymore because then I won't have any excuse. Well, Paul already says, you're without excuse because creation itself already demands a creator. Jesus, during his ministry, spoke more about hell than heaven. And he urgently informs us the decision must be made before the final judgment. His resurrection proved that death does not have the final say. We like to sing a song, uh, Prodigal Come Home. And I love that song. Uh, come home, come home. After a dynamic preacher gets up and really sets you on fire and then all the singers come come home come home I would say and my encouragement today get to know the father who loves you and gave you his word and let us listen for the opportunities when the prodigal calls in our world and they're looking for answers, let us be reasonable in our response to help people come back. I've mentioned a lot and we talked about in our class today that the world now is filled with people who have been religiously abused. And so it's not that they don't believe there's a God or Jesus is the Son of God, but they've just been discouraged because of the experiences they have with people that claim to represent God and now they let them down. Well, that's tough. We say that's life. Nobody in this world is going to live up to your expectations. That's just a reality. But as Q said this morning, and it was great, he was pretty proud of this, I like it. Um, <laughs> we can stand on the confidence that God sees us, as Bradley mentioned to us in his reading from Romans 3. God sees us now as righteous. What we need to do now is live up to God's expectation as best we can. And that's our challenge. As we get to know Jesus, we live up to his expectation. We feel better about ourselves and we help raise uh, the, the, the body up to maturity. So thank you for listening. I hope, could you hear me, Irene? Pretty good? All right, my voice is coming back. Pretty soon I'll fill out my suit. I'm really hoping that'll be sooner than later. Yeah, uh, I haven't been able to eat yet. It's really frustrating me. I, I'm still trying. I'll let you know when it happens. Um, but So God made us for a purpose. He has a perspective. And he wants us to be prepared. And that's our lesson for today. If you have any special needs or prayers, as Q comes up, we'll sing the invitation song. Thank you for enduring me today.